So enough of my um, talk, over to today's star attraction, and that's Jackie. Jackie is a learning manager at Historic Environment Scotland, um, who works with um, Scran, www.scran.ac.uk, within the learning and inclusion team. Um, Jackie um, has worked with the organisation for a number of years. Um, prior to working with us, she studied at the Edinburgh College of Art and later gained her master's degree at Duncan of Jordanston in public art, as well as a subsequent postgraduate diploma in exhibition interpretation. This girl had no uh, After over a decade of teaching art and design in secondary schools, she shifted her career to the heritage sector. Jackie now mostly works with digital archive material from Scran, so that's um, half a million records, and that doesn't count all the other material that's within HES's holdings. As a former art and design teacher, um, she endeavours to make engagement with schools and community groups as creative as possible, allowing people to explore heritage in a meaningful and enjoyable way. For example, um, just before lockdown, she worked with pupils at Castle Bray Community High School in Edinburgh in a partnership project to produce animations inspired by archives. This spun off into a fantastically successful um, social media campaign during lockdown, which focused on Italian, Scots and their associated heritage. Um, it was really, really successful, really engaging. The school were later awarded a special prize um, in the city of Edinburgh schools. Um, it was the, uh, the Paolozzi Prize. So enough of my chat, over to Jackie. Um, please place your questions. You can either wait till the end and place your questions in the chat, or you can place questions as we go. Um, and I will um, ask on your behalf at the end of Jackie's presentation. Over to you, Jackie. Hello, and thank you very much for that introduction, Neil. Um, and hello, everybody, and welcome to our talk today about the Scott Monument, otherwise known as the Gothic Rocket. Um, as Neil has said, I am Jackie Sangster. I'm part of the learning and inclusion team at HES, and I work mainly with all the archival records on Scran, as well as um, other HES archives, including Canmore, Britain from Above, National Collection of Aerial Photography, and so on. Historic Environment Scotland is the lead public body set up in 2015 to investigate, care for and promote Scotland's historic environment. HES services, properties and care and functions are varied and include well-known brands like Historic Scotland, Edinburgh Castle and of course Scran. It's worth noting at this point that all the imagery and information uh, contained in today's talk is gathered from Scran content and HES archives. So what is Scran? We provide access to online digital archives and collections, that is imagery alongside information. This is a small selection of the over 300 institutions who have contributed to the digital archival content on the Scran database over the years from national institutions to individuals. I'm happy to answer any queries about how to get a personal account for Scran or logging in at the end of the talk. Scran is free and like Neil said, you can simply email archives at hes.scot. So without further ado, let's go explore the Scott Monument. This Victorian Gothic monument to the Scottish writer, Sir Walter Scott, was once the largest monument to a writer in the world. The largest being the Jose Marti Memorial in Havana, Cuba. This portrait of Sir Walter Scott was painted by Sir Francis Grant in 1831. Scott's writing, particularly his historical novels with Scottish themes such as Waverley, has had a major influence on the perception of Scotland. He famously organised King George IV's visit to Edinburgh in 1822, which helped to rebrand Scotland's image and led to the revival of tartan and kilts, which continues today. This topic is a whole other archival 
exploration. However, today we will be looking at Scott's legacy within the built environment. A year after that portrait was paint, painted, Scott died. That is in the September of 1832 at home in Abbotsford. He was of course memorialized. This is the first memorial to be built for Sir Walter Scott. The statue was designed by John Greenshields and the column by David Rind. The monument stands 80 feet high and was executed by Handyside and Ritchie, built mm. in 1838. It predates Edinburgh's Gothic monument and stands proudly in Glasgow's George Square. This photograph is by Thomas Annan of Glasgow. However, we have not gathered today to discuss that monument, no. So how did the unavoidable Scott Monument, affectionately known as the Gothic Rocket, come about? Following his death, a competition to design a monument to Sir Walter Scott was launched in the spring of 1836, with the proviso that no architectural monument should be adopted of which a statue did not form a part and that it should be Gothic in style. The project was to cost £5,000. The competition was open to all. Entries included 22 Gothic structures, 11 statues in an architect architectural setting, 14 Grecian temples, five pillars, one obelisk and a fountain. This is a competition drawing for the Scott Monument which no doubt looks familiar. Fundraising for the monument started with donations of £500 from five of the Scottish banks. One of the earliest responses to the appeal was 1,525 rubles from bankers in St Petersburg. Further funds came from groups organised in Glasgow, Perth, Selkirk and also King William IV gave £300. Later, when lack of funds hit, house-to-house -house visits in Edinburgh were arranged to collect money. As with such projects, it went over budget. An engraving of the monument was given to everyone who contributed one guinea or more. This was possibly an, the image used to advertise or promote the collection or funds for the statue. However, there were 55 entries to the design competition, so the Scott Monument may have looked somewhat different. This is how it might have looked if architect William Playfair's proposal had won. Note this design idea is illustrated at the west end of Princess Street rather than the east. William Playfair earned Edinburgh its label as Athens of the North, on account of his many classical buildings, often in dramatic sites, which adorn the city. His work includes the Royal Scottish Academy and the National Gallery of Scotland. You can see how pro proposals varied. Here in contrast is David Roberts, a celebrated painter's design for the memorial. This is the only image by him in connection with the project to have survived and shows a Gothic cross. Another competition drawing, this one was one of the top three entries and prizes of 50 guineas were offered to the top three designs. Another hopeful design entry, a watercolour and pencil elevation by J. Henderson. Shown here, this time on frames. This design elevation was submitted by Rickman and Hussey, architects of Birmingham. How different Princess Street and indeed Edinburgh would have looked. Let us return to the approved winning design we have glimpsed earlier by George Nico Kemp. William Byrne, another architect who incidentally employed Kemp, said of this design, its purity as a Gothic monument and more particularly 
the constructive skill exhibited throughout in the combination of graceful features of that style of architecture, the composition and in the perfect solidity which it would possess when built. Now, let's take a look at the monument maker. Who was he? Meet Mr. George Meikle Kemp. Kemp was born near Bigger on the 25th of May, 1795, into a shepherding family. He apprenticed as a carpenter before becoming a millwright in Gala Shields, and apparently Sir Walter Scott once gave him a lift there. He later became a self-taught draftsman. Once sketching at Melrose Abbey, Kemp, Kemp spotted Scott. Some of the sketches he made that day in Melrose were eventually used in the design of the Scott Monument. Kemp's competition success was not, however, without taint. It was considered remarkable how similar the design was to that mm. presented by David Roberts. Whether Kemp was a genius or a copycat cannot be said. However, he certainly had ambition. Curiously, even his competition entry was submitted under a pseudonym, John Morvo, who was the medieval master mason of Kelso Abbey. Kemp's plan took almost a decade to erect, during which time it became an object of interest for many. Kemp is pictured here with plans for the monument in his hand. He is posed on site with the tools of the trade, leaning on an architectural stone carvings. And if you look closely, there is a set of measuring calipers resting against them. There is also an open toolbox beside him and his foot is resting on a mason's mell or mallet beside a T-square. The early Scottish photography pioneer, David Octavius Hill, captured this image. Hill's partnership with Robert Adamson produced some of the finest photographic portraits and landscapes of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. In under five years, they produced 1,800 pictures. By the way, Hill was married to sculptor Amelia Patton, whose character statues can be seen on the Scott Monument. This is a contract drawing by George Meikle Kemp, made in 1841. Standing 61 metres high, with an inner stairway leading to a balcony at the top. Some of the features of the elaborate Gothic structure have been borrowed or adapted from Reim, Rouen, Antwerp and other continental sources. Tragically, Kemp died before the monument was complete. On the night of the 6th of March, 1844, he is thought to have lost his way in thick fog after visiting his contractor near the old canal basin in Fountain Bridge. His body was found in the canal a week later. Rumours inevitably spread that he had been drunk or had committed suicide through depression or that some jealous rival in the Scott Monument competition had attacked him. There was no evidence at all for any of this. Over 1,000 people attended his funeral his coffin was carried to St Cuthbert Cemetery at the west end of Princess Street by the, his workmen, who by all accounts thoroughly respected his humble origins and depth of knowledge. Now we shall look at some of the incredible imagery captured by Hill and Adamson during the construction of the Scott Monument from 1840 to 1844. After Kemp's death, work continued under the supervision of his brother-in-law, William Bonner. Helen Adamson's sequence of calotype photographs depict the growth of the construction. This one shows two supervisors or architects in the tall stovepipe hats, conversing with the workers on site. The old town and Edinburgh Castle rise up in the distance as a backdrop. 
the monument was capped on the 26th of October, 1844. Here we see stonemasons working at the Scott Monument. Supervision of construction was entrusted to Kemp, then following his untimely death to Bonner, and the contract was assigned to a Mr. David Lind. This is an invitation to Freemasons to attend the laying of the foundation stone of the Metropolitan Monument on the 15th of August, 1840. Kemp had convinced the committee to allow a foundation on bedrock to be excavated due to the proposed height of the monument and the fact that the Caledonian Railway Company, who entered Edinburgh from Carstairs in 1848, they proposed to tunnel under Princes Street within just eight feet of the foundation. Here we see more masons working on the Scott Monument in 1844. The stone used to build the Scott Monument was Binney Sandstone from Uphill in West Lothian. This is possibly one of the most astounding of Hill and Adamson's calotype images. And again, the Scott Monument at the midpoint during its construction. Here we see two later photographs taken before October 1844 with elaborate scaffolding adjoining the structure. Making progress another calotype. Kemp's monument was capped on the 26th of October, 1844, and the scaffolding removed soon after. It is likely this photograph was taken near the end of 1844 or during 1845. Sculptor John Steele's statue of Walter Scott is missing in this image, as it was installed wasn't installed until 1846. This drawing is the inauguration ceremony in 1846, showing the massed crowds gathered on the mound near where the Playfair steps are. The image of the monument is rather sketchy, but it conveys well the thousands of people attending. People came from all over. The steamer Britannia had brought three to four hundred people from Dundee the evening before. Other ferries had arrived in the morning from Fife and a train had come from Burns country with hundreds aboard. The procession was described in the Scotsman newspaper as a moving stream of umbrellas with long lines of stationary umbrellas for its banks. Moving on to look at some of the art and craft related or created to adorn the Scott Monument. Let's introduce Aberdonian John Robert Steele, probably best remembered for his sculpture of Sir Walter Scott on the Scott Monument. He was sculptor to the Queen, that's Queen Victoria in Scotland and knighted for his work. In the first guidebook to the monument in 1852, the statue is described as, the expression of countenance is charming. His dog, Maida, who has been lying by his side, appears to have been startled by the shutting of the book in the hand of his master, and seems to be participating in the pleasure which is spread over the face of his master. Interestingly, it was the first outdoor sculpture created in Scotland from Italian Carrera marble. The block weighed 30 tonnes and was shipped over from Italy. However, at Livorno it fell into the sea and at Leith there was no machinery powerful enough to lift it. It was eventually positioned on the monument at a cost of £100. On an aside, did you know there is a bronze copy. This is a replica statue which resides on Literary Walk in Central Park, New York. 
it was bought by a group of Scottish New York residents uh, to celebrate the centenary of Scott's birth and was unveiled in 1872. Of course, Scott's figure is not the only sculpture on the monument. Earlier I mentioned this woman, the sculptor Amelia Patton, who was married to the photographer Octavius Hill. Patton created three character statues on the Scott Monument. Left to right, we see uh, Richard Coeur de Lyon, Minnie Troil, the pirate's daughter, and Magnus Troil, the pirate. The monument became a vehicle for sculptural historical figures and characters from Scott's novels. There are 24 in total in the niches. By the way, Amelia Patton also sculpted the David Livingstone Monument adjacent to the Scott Monument. The embellishments on the monument are not restricted to stone, however. Within the monument on the first floor, there are four stained glass windows designed by Scottish artist David Roberts and made by James Ballantyne. They are the coat of arms of the city of Edinburgh, the coat of arms of Scotland, St Andrew and St Giles. There are of course numerous grotesque character faces on the Scott Monument too. These are typical stonemason jokes common in Gothic architecture when medieval stonemasons carved all manner of weird and wonderful faces, gargoyles and other grotesques on the great cathedrals of Europe. A quirky tradition which has continued today by Scottish stonemasons. You may be aware of the sci-fi alien lurking on Paisley Abbey, for example, which arrived during the 1990s refurbishment there. This figure is Dominique Sampson from the novel The Antiquary in a very characteristic pose. He has had replacement fingers added Missing elements and details like these fingers were first modelled in clay and then stone replacements were carved and attached to the statue. This was done for all the damaged sculptural details. The monument, although mighty, is not invincible. Here we see Aldriki and the monument shrouded in smoke from nearby Waverley Railway Station in 1956. Here, the monument looms large behind a snowy tram in 1951. Over a century of exposure to the elements and pollution obviously took its toll. Wear and tear on the building materials has led to different renovation projects over the years. For example, here, the St Giles window is being reinstalled in 1968. In the 1990s, it was proposed that the stone should be cleaned and a thorough assessment of the structure be made and the City of Edinburgh had a complete photogrammetric, photogrammetric, <laughs> I can't speak today, uh, survey was done. Photogrammetry is the method of preparing accurate measurements from photography and is regularly used to survey historic buildings. Photographs were taken in stereo pairs to, re to prepare drawings such as this one in 1990. The decision, however, was made not to clean the monument due to the damage it would sustain. However, stone restoration went ahead this involved replacing old repairs and damaged areas with binny stone. Therefore, the quarry at Uphall in West Lothian was especially reopened to excavate the stone with which to make the repairs. So up went the scaffolding again, and here it is in 1998. Some of you no doubt recall it looking like this too, festooned with festive lights in 1991. Today, it's almost impossible to imagine Princess Street without the Scott Monument. However, it has not always been there, as surveys show us. Here is a map of Edinburgh 
1836 and definitely Lower Scott Monument. 1837, still no reference to a monument. It has not been erected. It has not been started. And here it is. The Scott Monument has landed on Princess Street. This map is from the Ordnance Survey sheet from 1877 to 1881. Our last look here at the map of Edinburgh and Leith, 1912. I just wanted to share this tiny glimpse at some of the beautiful archive maps from National Library of Scotland. Since the dawn of tourism in Scotland, souvenirs, merchandise and memorabilia featuring the Scott Monument have been popular. Here are a few such keepsakes and paraphernalia found in our digital archive stores. A charming biscuit tin with an embossed image, probably from the 1960s. It once contained biscuits from McVitie and Price, an Edinburgh manufacturer. This striking glass centrepiece was made around 1870 at the Bathgate Glassworks in West Lothian. This paperweight featuring the Scott Monument was made somewhere between 1855 and 1900. And today it is looked after by Perth Museum and Art Gallery. This 1850 curiosity is a floral model of the Scott Monument, complete with Gothic style steeple on a stepped plinth. And there's even a sculpture set beneath the spire and the square corner turrets. Possibly my own favorite item is this Chinese bank note featuring the Scott Monument and Princess Street. Sadly, there's no further information based, uh, on this note, uh, but it's looked after by City of Edinburgh Council. But it certainly shows the international appeal of the man and his monument. This brass replica of the Scott Monument is a thermometer and is looked after by Edinburgh University Library. And this decanter depicting the monument was made by John Ford and Company Holyrood Glassworks uh, near the Canongate in the 1800s. Finally, we have the Edinburgh Rose, a souvenir paper fold out pink rose with scenes of Edinburgh. Uh, the illustrated envelope has an engraving of the monument and Waverley Bridge and the castle. Now to have a look at some monumental views. Included on this North British Railway timetable dates from 1902 and the monument is at the top with all the other familiar scenes of Scotland. This view is an etching from 1850 of East Princess Street Gardens shortly after they were extensively remodelled following the building of the railway. The horse and coaches in this scene were very soon to be replaced with horse tram cars which started on the city streets in 1871. And here we have Edinburgh from the Mound in 1873. Princess Street taken from the Scott Monument this time looking east in 1875. Looking the Scott Monument and Princess Street from Waverley Market in 1880. Racing forward into the exciting 1920s with this evocative image from the Robert Greaves archive. What I really love about this one is the cyclist sandwich between the trams and buses. It could easily be today. Now taking to the skies with that wonderful From Britain From Above archive in 1925. Dizzying. 1948. And again, another angle in 1948. With Sir Walter Scott looking over us, our archival tour is coming to a halt. This year, as Neil said earlier, we celebrate 250 years since the birth of Sir Walter Scott in 1771. Like this Sharabang tour from Grimsby in the 1920s, 
people have flocked to see the Scott Monument for over 175 years, almost 175 years, and will no doubt continue to wander at it well into the foreseeable future. Please do not forget to collect your souvenir documentation, which certifies that you have indeed climbed the 287 steps to the top of the Scott Monument today, at least archivally speaking. These have been issued since 1948. By 1949, four and a half thousand have been sold at a penny each. Before I say goodbye, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have um, about the Scott Monument itself. And if you would like to, I'd be very happy for you to follow Scran Life on social media.